and uh, to Margaret as well. Uh, and I want to begin by uh, um, offering my most sincere acknowledgments to uh, to Eric for uh, his his um, large amount of work uh, logistically and some of the slides in making this possible. Um, to Ron for opening up opportunities for me to first come to PHEC and um, continuing uh, involvement with, with his group. It's a great pleasure and honor and privilege to be talking with you today. And um, while the time afforded to us is brief, I'm really excited to share, share some aspects of this work we've been conducting, um, which is uh, seeking to apply elements of this emerging field of data science, of, of big data as it's sometimes called, um, to the very pressing issues um, that confront us in epidemiology. So next slide. I'm, I'm going to be um, uh, going in this presentation through just a bit of motivation for this work, building on comments that uh, Jaya, uh, uh, Guy has kindly uh, offered there, and then go on to um, give an overview of this platform, which we built um, to, to try to be responsive to these needs. Um, uh, I'll then be talking very briefly towards the end about some of the very important ways I think these uh, techniques work hand in glove with much of the other work we're conducting with Ron's group and, and others um, on, on using dynamic models, particularly to, to help um, make sense of the cacophony of evidence out there and to, to more quickly, robustly, and deeply learn from that evidence. And then finally, uh, making some concluding remarks. So next slide. Um, so the motivation uh, for this work really lies in the, uh, the ever more complex uh, health challenges that confront us um, uh, within our country and across the world. Um, and without going into those uh, in, in enormous detail, I think we're all familiar with the, uh, uh, the uh, growing need for life, life course perspectives with respect to uh, many chronic diseases and their risk factors, the uh, long shadows cast by early life insults, and um, as some of our work in the uh, gestational diabetes and type 2 diabetes is suggested even uh, profound intergenerational epigenetic effects that, uh, that play a, a substantial role in shaping health outcomes <clears throat> here in Canada. We're also increasingly dealing with multifactorial um, uh, conditions which involve multiple complications such as in the diabetes context, all in the, on the, in the um, sphere of heavy burdens of health, of health disparities which which bedevil um, our system and, and those of, of many other countries. Um, we're also increasingly seeing syndemics among mutual interacting conditions and really distressing mental health gaps in the context of a population that's growing ever older and, and where uh, care is increasingly needing to be, uh, be delivered uh, at, a, at a population-wide level that's unprecedented. Uh, so, uh, next slide. Um, we've uh, long been seeking to leverage the power of, of models, um, of, of dynamic modeling in particular, um, that, that informs policy discourse in these areas. So, whether it's communicable diseases or whether it's the burden of, of type 2 diabetes among uh, our Aboriginal peoples, or whether it's aspects uh, having to do with the, um, the end stage renal disease care delivery or indeed the um, provision of, of care throughout our province here with our Ministry of Health. We've long looked to models to inform uh, our understanding of uh, policy trade-offs and to identify interventions that are particularly powerful. But one of the uh, challenges which we've re to which we've recurrently run in is, is the fact that often um, there's a, a dearth of data on uh, absolutely key components of the situation, uh, key aspects of health behaviors, whether it's people's uh, physical activity, uh, aspects of their nutritional intake and, and diet, um, uh, components of their uh, contact patterns that might be relevant for transmission of pathogen or indeed of, of knowledge, attitudes, behaviors, and norms with respect to chronic disease risk factors. Um, Often, often uh, the key data on health behaviors is, uh, is difficult to elicit. Um, our large-scale survey instruments, such as the CCHS and MPHS, do a wonderful job um, alerting us to, to uh, dynamics associated with many risk factors. But when it comes to things like uh, accurately picking up physical activity 
or um, or recording a diet or contact patterns or where people spend the time. They're very blunt instruments. And we know from studies with the NHANES 3 and, and other instruments in the States, just the huge disparities that can exist, say, between self-reported physical activity and, and what's actually measured using uh, accelerometry, for example, or accelerometry and, and heart rate uh, variation. And part of the challenge that, that motivated this work is absent understanding of these health behaviors um, and the context in which they play out, uh, the potential to really quantitatively evaluate policy trade-offs using models or using uh, other types of more traditional uh, instruments is, is really greatly limited. Um, next slide. Um, while I don't have time to go into uh, the details of various textures, there are some uh, classic problems that help motivate much of this work. Um, some was work that we've uh, pursued with Jeannie Brooks Gunn uh, at Columbia University looking at the impacts of, of shifting people from low-income housing to mixed-income neighborhoods, where the, the evidence that's available through traditional instruments showing um, uh, gains, for example, uh, in reducing obesity, uh, lowering criminal involvement among teenage girls and improving uh, high school graduation rates has been the source of a lot of contention as to what's driving those. Is it, for example, to take the, the case of obesity alone, um, to what degree are these gains that have been observed driven by um, greater neighborhood walkability, greater availability of recreational space and perceived safety, and therefore moderate to physical into vigorous physical activity, or to what degree is it through aspects of healthiness of diet, greater access to uh, healthy food stores offering fresh fruit and produce, um, to what degree is it spent in, uh, actually through the fact that these girls in, in these mixed income neighborhoods where they, their social network is less tight, where they've been uh, parachuted into a new social environment, maybe they're spending more time at home and, and eating more of mom's cooking rather than, than out there in fast food restaurants. Um, there's, there's a lot of questions why we see those gains in, in obesity levels. Uh, and uh, the evidence from uh, traditional surveys was, was very ambiguous. It was often, as I say, blunt in the sense that it wasn't picking up with reliability these different pathways to effect. Similarly, for levels of criminal involvement, especially in light of the fact that boys in the moving to opportunity study of, of re housing relocation showed adverse outcomes in criminal involvement. Um, if we go to the next slide, um, you know, similar uh, challenges confronted us in some work we were planning in, in the context of uh, physical, um, uh, physical uh, activity and nutritional interventions in the Chinese context, trying to reason about the interactions of various pathways here shown in a way that reflects their very tangled reality in terms of their outcomes uh, of interest, uh, impact on the outcome of interest with progression to diabetes. So often we have this very big challenge which confronts us in really making sense of why observed interventions um, yields, uh, yields uh, the effects that they do, whether it's a null effect of, of almost no change or, or a uh, effect that's very promising indeed. Through what particular pathways is that effect realized? Why is it that, that the effects haven't been uh, secured that we were hoping? So uh, whether we're doing modeling and we need to capture this information and, and the details of the model, or we're trying to reason at a higher level about some of the trade-offs of these interventions, um, we're often stuck with uh, limited evidence to bring to the table. Evidence that we know from studies is often fraught with uh, reporting bias, recall bias, and, and various challenges. Um, so uh, in this next little component, I'm going to talk about IEPI, and this is the talk outline slide here. Um, so next slide here. Um, in terms of kind of the, this particular approach, um, all those in the room and those on the line here will surely be familiar with the uh, amazing level of, of rapid penetration that smartphones have, 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 have secured within the Canadian context to the point where they are uh, quite widely used now even in lower socioeconomic groups. Um, and, you know, these are uh, amazing te uh, technologies. Um, they allow us to, um, to make use of a wide variety of communicational mediums 
and uh, they provide incredible functionality in terms of our day-to-day -day activities, whether it's checking, checking up on email, um, texting our kids, um, sharing photos on Snapchat, whether it's recording lectures like this one. Um, these phones are capable of amazing things. Um, what's less widely recognized is that a lot of that functionality is made possible because they're chock-a-block full of sensors. And they're chock-a-block full of ways of kind of communicating with the environment and sensing that environment contextually so that we can figure out where we are, with whom we're located, and figure out uh, aspects of our um, physical activity levels, et cetera. So next slide. Um, this slide is, is titled uh, IAPI, our Generation 2 Sensing Survey and Crowdsourcing Platform. Starting about six years ago during the H1N1 pandemic, we began our first work looking at um, ubiquitous sensing to inform our modeling efforts. Um, and I'm going to be presenting here our Generation 2 system, which has been extant for about five years and is based on Android-based smartphones. Um, they, it, this runs on commodity smartphones, which are fully functional devices that offer all the normal uh, goodies that people look to with their smartphone. Um, and therefore, there's internal incentives to carry the, the phones that, that feature this IFE app. Um, there's this app that runs in the background, typically, although you can summon it to the foreground um, to interact with it. And episodically, uh, say every two minutes, one minute out of every two minutes, or two minutes out of every five, it's collecting data. And we'll talk a little bit more about what that data looks like. But um, it does so in a bursty sort of way that prolongs its battery life. And it collects a wide variety of, of sensor modalities, but also provides context driven surveys and a way of sort of proactively reporting study-specific information. For example, the fact that you may be um, using a cigarette, or the fact that you're uh, taking insulin, um, or the fact that um, you, are, you are currently testing your blood sugar levels. Um, there's an opportunistic data backhaul that brings this data back to our server. So next slide, IFE system architecture. We have this um, set of, of uh, apps that are running on the, on the smartphone. We'll talk more about them. But um, periodically, they, they try to collect, uh, connect to our servers. And um, these servers can be located at any number of different institutions. And they try to push data um, catch as catch can in an opportunistic way up to our servers so that we can um, uh, examine that data, um, both for its health implications in terms of health behavior, but also for its uh, implications in terms of compliance, in terms of any technical issues, um, and so we can interact with patients and help them over any hurdles. So next slide. Um, uh, this is example past in current areas of IEPI. We're, we've been fortunate to see the system adopted by a wide variety of partners. Um, we've got some very exciting work going on in Boston, Worcester, and Lawrence right now in Massachusetts with the American Legacy Foundation, the, the group that's in charge of tobacco regulation in the states and with Harvard School of Public Health and Dana-Farber. We have some really neat work going on uh, that's just been funded uh, with, um, uh, with WCBM and, and another branch of PHAC looking at foodborne illness exposures and reporting and recall bias in that area. Um, we've also been used it to look at impacts of housing vouchers um, in the context of randomized clinical trials for uh, sequestration um, for communicable disease spread and exer games for kids, et cetera. So it's, it's pretty widely used now um, by a wide variety of partners uh, worldwide. And uh, next slide, uh, not surprisingly, we're seeking to address with the system a lot of the areas where gaps, I've mentioned there being gaps. Uh, where we know that people self-report you know, often flies in the face of, of uh, what physical measures would suggest. And these include things like location, physical activity, spatial proximity of individuals. Um, you know, if you're concerned about spreading a flu, it's going to be very important who's standing near, who, near whom for how long and how closely. Um, aspects of social context and communicational behaviors. Um, and uh, so we have systems set up to record aspects of all of these. If we go to the next slide, geographic movement, it goes without saying these devices have GPS for external movement. But um, uh, if you go to the next slide, differences between neighborhoods, 
because we're collecting this in information over time, we can capture people's um, uh, movement and travel through a city, for example, people who live in different areas of a city with different uh, with different levels of services and exposure to resources, we can capture aspects of their movement uh, through the city to understand how their activity spaces, the areas they, in which they actually circulate, not merely the areas near their home or workplace, but where they're actually circulating based on their bus routes or, or other travel, um, towards what services that brings them in exposure. Next slide in customization. Um, I'll come back to some of the data, and particularly cross-linking, but I wanted to, to emphasize that this is a system that we've designed from the bottom up to be eminently flexible and customizable. So every study using the system can feature its own user interface. So this might include custom buttons, say, for a study of gestational diabetes, which would record um, uh, blood sugar testing and record stressors they might have experienced or... Um, or uh, use of, of, of metformin or, or insulin to better control glycemic levels. Um, but a study of, of smoking, um, like we're conducting with a smoking behavior and, its, um, and the exposures associated with it, might, might have a button associated with uh, to take a picture of, of messaging that, to which someone's been exposed. We, each study also can very easily modify <clears throat> without any programming <clears throat> the um, regimen by which it uh, samples data, what data is collected, how frequently, and it can issue custom surveys, <clears throat> custom questionnaires that, um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, that that can include questions um, specific to that survey and, and have certain rules under which they're triggered. For example, when you go outside or when you're in the proximity of a park or when you're um, when, you're, when you arrive home after a day or af just after a bout of physical activity, it might trigger questions uh, germane to that context. Um, and all but the user interface of this is designed to evolve during the study. We're, we're working at the user interface part to evolve that, and probably in another few months that will, it's underway and it will be in hand. But um, right now, it's, it's the broader mechanisms that can evolve. And we do evolve it uh, as we discover issues with, um, with our compliance or what have you. Um, next slide, this is proactive reporting. I emphasize that there's study-specific um, buttons, for example, or other types of user interfaces that could be uh, used to record types of information. So when we've used this in the, in the West Nile exposure context, uh, we've literally had buttons for people to report encounters with mosquitoes. Um, you know, we've, we've had in other cases uh, people reporting use of medicine um, or, or to report um, uh, messaging exposure. Next slide, questionnaires. These are micro questionnaires that the device can ask. So, um, so you know, multiple times a day, um, uh, people uh, are uh, exposed to these questions. There's a little audio reminder that comes up with them. And um, they have a couple minutes, um, if, they're, if they have the time to do it, to, uh, to answer one or two questions per micro-questionnaire. These can be timed to arrive at random intervals during the day, such as classic and uh, ecological momentary assessment, um, at fixed times during the day, um, or, or can be contextually triggered, can be triggered by... Uh, you're being indoors or outdoors, triggered by the sudden appearance of people nearby you, so we know you're in a crowded area. It might ask you questions about your links to those people. And we've done those sort of things for, for studies, um, for example, for the RCT that we ran, uh, funded through the US CDC. Um, now, a key question, um, uh, key questionnaire role in this, so next slide, key questionnaire role is disambiguation. It really you know, the data that we collect through sensors is, is uh, it matches all the four Vs of, of big data. You know, it's, it's high volume, it's high velocity, it, it's, it tends to be uh, higher veracity in the sense that you have less, it, it's less bedeviled by, um, by recall bias or interviewer bias, et cetera. And finally, it's of greater variety. But often there's a real need to understand the context and, and give, it, uh, give it life, as it were, by some measure of qualitative self-report 
or, or um, indication uh, through self-reporting by the individual as to um, you know, what, is, what is going on at this time, even if it's only confirmatory. And um, so often the questionnaires will be, for example, asking this physical activity that is currently underway or is just finished, what was the motivation for it? Was it for utilitarian reasons? Was it for recreational motivation? Was it because um, you, know, you, you had uh, uh, a, a desire to improve your health? Um, these are the sort of questions we can ask that will give us a sense of kind of the motivations for the health behaviors that are noticed um, or help us link uh, a bout of smoking to whether it was a stressor or whether it was a bit of celebration that was associated with it. Um, next slide for federated systems. A very important component of this system, a very important avenue for, for, um, for enhancing its values in today's environment is, is linking it with the increasing um, diversity and richness of other data sources that are available. So in some cases, this might be administrative data, such as we've long used here in Saskatchewan. Um, but in other cases, um, it might be data from, um, from other sensors. So we, for example, for some of our studies, we've had the data from the phone be cross-linked to, to data from weight scale. So pe when people go home and weigh themselves through a, a, tech, uh, a protocol known as Bluetooth, it, it measures the, uh, the weight that was recorded on the scale, and that's all cross-linked with the other information about their physical activity, their nutritional intake through pictures they took of their meals. Um, it's it's cross-linked to information on their social context, their physical location during the day, et cetera. In other cases, um, uh, systems like this have been cross-linked with weather information as gathered by um, by uh, you know from weather services. So. For example, I live in a city which is, um, is known for a measure of seasonal variability in its weather, and uh, we've, we've taken to try to understand some of the, the differences in movement patterns we see uh, in the course of a study uh, by linking it with cold or, or, or other inclement weather. Um, next slide. Um, we're, we're actively working on various extensions to this system that would provide um, information on a wide variety of other uh, contexts or, um, or uh, types of behavior. So if we go to the next slide, um, some of the greatest power from a system like this is, is through its ability to cross-link information. Each of the sensors in isolation, say accelerometry or GPS, is interesting, but it's really when you combine those together that you start to get a, a really compelling picture of what's going on. And especially when you combine those with uh, self-reports, this crowdsourcing aspect of using these buttons, or you combine it with data from questionnaires. So here, we, for example, we show a glimpse of activity level shown over our geography for our uh, fair city. In the next uh, slide, social interactions during and after work. Uh, the next slide, um, it kept, uh, leveraging our ability to measure people's inside location to the point of, you know, multiple floors of a building, different rooms within a given building. Putting aside GPS, we can do this through Wi-Fi triangulation. By looking at the strength of Wi-Fi signals, we can figure out when they're in different spaces inside. Uh, we can map out, you know, where contacts take place and whether they were with other study participants or certain non-participants within the um, uh, that can be picked up because of Bluetooth, um, uh, Bluetooth uh, enablement. So I'm going to skip this slide on other electronic data sources, um, but go to a slide that says leveraging GIS databases. And this has been very important for us to understand, for example, uh, aspects relevant to social determinants of health. So those who live on our west side, to what degree are they exposed in their activity spaces to uh, grocery stores compared to uh, convenience stores, compared to those who live in our east side neighborhoods. This is information or information on park availability and their closeness to parks or to fast food restaurants to which we can look to um, GIS databases. And we've done quite a lot of work along those lines. Next slide. It, it goes without saying, having worked in the, the health area for uh, over 15 years now, um, a foremost goal for building the system 
a goal that we had in mind long before we started work on either of our uh, gener two generations of systems is the issue of security and confidentiality. Um, this is absolutely paramount, and we built the system from ground up to be extraordinarily secure, extraordinarily um, careful in terms of the data that it collects, and we actually um, uh, deliberately suppress certain types of data that could be identifying, for example, Bluetooth names of devices because of concerns over confidentiality. We have, for all of our studies, featured a snooze option whereby participants can opt out of data collection. And that's very important um, because it allows us, among other things, to distinguish noncompliance due to you know, a day being too busy, um, the phone just runs out of power, they haven't had a chance to, to, to plug it in, versus the case or you know, where people leave the phone at home through forgetfulness versus situations where people would otherwise leave it at home because they don't want to have their movements tracked. So we allow this opt-out that can be extremely easily tapped at any point, and we teach them how to do that, and they can, um, they can have data not collected on them during, during that time. Our observation has been that use of that feature differs strongly by different subgroups. And interestingly, in some of our uh, more vulnerable groups, we've seen a lot more use of that than, um, than in our, our well-to-do uh, study participants. Um, we, um, we do have a very, very rigorous encryption protocol that runs on top to the point where uh, your speaker right now if he captured one of these phones, as he's been known to do, and were to take it apart and, uh, and work at it, uh, despite my PhD in computer science, I would be uh, probably stymied for a point of several months to make any headway at sort of making sense of the data that's on the device. A key constraint for all of this is, uh, next slide, is the energy limitations of the device. We can't collect data 24 by 7 at all times. Um, uh, you know, every minute because there's limited battery life. And um, while we may not compare with Facebook in terms of battery consumption, we do need to preserve the battery life of the participants' phones so that we um, we make sure that the device um, still has a nice long lifespan, and we don't and we and they still have this internal drive to carry it. Um, so uh, just going to make some some final remarks here. So next slide. Um, the data value propositions associated with this, I think, are, are some of them are listed here. We're making physical measurements for many, many uh, uh, things that are hard to get accurate self-report via accurate self-report. These include things like physical activity, location, social context. Um, it's intensively longitudinal, and it's cross-linked. It's richly cross-linked between multiple types of sensors and, and uh, survey results. It has remarkable levels of temporal resolution. So we have minute by minute level data on evolution of contact patterns, for example, during the flu pandemic. And you know, the fact that we have so many things crosslinked can give us can help us triangulate our understanding of what's going on from multiple measurements and multiple self reports via uh, the the buttons, the the, the crowdsourced uh, data, and via the uh, questionnaires. It is automatic collection, and it's it's streamed back live so we can, while a study is going on, we can kind of monitor compliance, monitoring technical issues, monitoring issues having to do with uh, uh, the health behaviors and potentially use that to shape, um, shape our decisions about how to proceed, how long to run the study, et cetera. Um, we do have the option to push content to participants so we can update their surveys, add another survey, et cetera. And we can delineate pathways that are driving outcomes. So, you know, a key, uh, key value add that I see is sort of deepening our ability to learn from interventions. Um, so, you know, if, if we have an intervention that, uh, that has been undertaking, say, um, a physical activity, um, uh, a social support program um, for uh, Aboriginal youth on reserve, um, if, if we examine the outcomes, we may not see much nudge in terms of the, the crude outcomes of interest, perhaps it's BMI, over the time frame. But there's a question of why. And, you know, did we affect uh, physical activity and not sedentary behavior? Uh, how, did we end up impacting diet? You know, was there 
in some cases, an increase in sugar-sweetened beverage consumption that compensated for physical activity. When we have this greater resolution, we have a greater chance of resolving which pathways to an intervention outcome were successfully nudged and how quickly, and which are, are not being uh, successfully affected, are being adversely affected, or are just taking longer time to affect them. We can also recognize effects such as that would be hard to secure through self-report, such as bleed-through effects. The fact that we know that when we have an intervention group and uh, there's still probably likely to be effects on non-intervention group. So I'm going to, um, just to finish up quickly, I'm going to skip forward one or two slides here to the slide that says models making sense of the data. To make sense of this data, to, to kind of link it to things that are important to us in terms of high-level uh, health behaviors, um, in terms of, of recognizing um, uh, gains uh, in those health behaviors, and in terms of, of linking it to um, policy uh, implications. A key component is these levels of models. And we work with statistical models, uh, machine learning models, which, which help us classify behavior at a given time, help us recognize for example, is, is the phone even being carried on a person? Help us recognize, is this person indoors or outdoors? Maybe we notice a lot of, uh, a lot of um, activity through the accelerometer, but maybe it's because they're in a vehicle. And we look to machine learning model, models to kind of clue us into those aspects of context. There's, there's also inference models that can help us infer where influence may be passing through in a social network, and dynamic models of the sort that Ron's group is building and, and uh, where, where we're having this emerging collaboration to help us link these type of data up to policy impacts, to help us understand, make sense of this data for what it means in terms of the likely outcomes of prospective policies. So um, uh, just going on now to the final uh, few slides of this talk, um, uh, there's inferential models that allow us to deduce things in these simulation models that help capture hypothesized causal relationships between diverse factors. And this data, um, and I'm on the slide that says simulation models, this sort of data that we're getting can help us much more effectively make use of these simulation models because it pins them down more effectively. It, these simulation models, in many ways, what they're helping us do is make more reliable, deeper, and more robust um, uh, use of the evidence that's available. And, uh, and this type of evidence that we're collecting with these smartphones can be a key component in, in helping these models be really grounded and, and help, them, help them sort of under, help them give us an under insight into how the, uh, the policies that we might be considering um, in terms of different types of physical activity programs, different types of dietary modifications, how those might be likely to play out over the longer term and how they might scale up in an implementation science concept uh, context to, to sort of be brought to scale at a, larger, at a larger level. So, you know, these sort of models, these simulation models that, that Ron and I uh, work with, these can help us understand how to most effectively interact um, uh, with with the the pathways that are in effect and how we can most fruitfully change system structure. So um, just skipping on to the conclusions here, uh, watching the time and making sure we have time for questions. Um, broad conclusions: um, uh, sensor-bearing devices are increasingly ubiquitous. They're in most of the pockets of people listening to this talk, and um, you know commodity devices of these sorts. Uh, devices that we don't think of as, as health-related per se can serve a dual purpose as, as versatile sensor platforms, EMA platforms for ecological momentary assessment and crowdsourcing platforms, um, in addition to, to fulfilling their normal roles and knitting together aspects of our life. Um, uh, there's diverse communicational signals around that can help us derive the context that people are in at any one time. And when coupled with models, this sort of sensor data can offer significant and complementary health insights. And um, you know, if we cross-link this data uh, with other data sources, we have tremendous ability to complement and sharp, sharpen traditional methods. This is not about 
replacing methods. It's about uh, traditional methods. It's about um, extending their utility um, and, and enhancing their value more broadly. Um, and the sort of data that we can collect can enhance the insightfulness, the timeliness, and the reliability and cost of traditional survey instruments while reducing the burden by allowing collection automatically of data that would otherwise have to be recorded manually. And really a key use of this data is to learn more quickly from, um, from uh, interventions, whether they're successful or not. They help us, help us learn from our experience, learn from the evidence, and more quickly build on that evidence so that we can, um, uh, we can secure even more, more powerful nudges to the, uh, um, to the behavior, the health behaviors of, of people out there and better understand those health behaviors as they might need further, further addressing. So those are all the comments that I have here. Um, I wanted to provide acknowledgments for those that may help make this possible, including Ron, who first brought me to PHEC, and, and to um, my various collaborators who have played such an important role in this, in this work. So those are all my prepared comments, and I'd be happy to answer any questions here. Well, go to the phone. I think there are a couple of people. Are, is there any questions from individuals on the phone?